Hey everyone, this is Philip, and welcome to the Philip Show. Listen, we're about to get started. Get your coffee. So today, if you have goals out there, if you have dreams out there, and you are finding reasons not to pursue them, get your pen, get your paper, because today we are talking about pursuing your dreams, going for what you want, making the moves that you need to make, because you know you have somewhere to go in spite of, in spite of your excuses, in spite of the challenges, in spite of what people, even you might say. Listen, today we have Terry Mori on the show. And as a person with cerebral palsy, Terry Moria has been blessed to have over 20 years in the entertainment industry, sports, music, sidebar, 20 years. We'll come back to that. And he's had the opportunity to work with the NBA Entertainment, Queen Latifah, Walt Disney, MTV, Atlantic Records, and it just goes on. In 2010, he was also invited by the White House to witness President Obama signing the 20th year anniversary of the Americans with Disability Act. And with his business partner, legendary hip hop artist MC Light, Terry launched LearnTheMusicBusiness.com, a membership website that teaches aspiring artists about the music industry. He's written two books, How to Launch Your Music Career in 21 Days and Fearless Dreams, and How a Disabled Kid from Brooklyn Lived His Dreams in the Entertainment Business. And listen, I told you, get your pen and paper. There's more. He is also helping you remain protected and working with Legal Shield. I, I'm just gonna get out the way. Terry, hey. Terry. Hey, what's going on, man? Thank you, thank you. An amazing, amazing introduction. Listen, I you're appreciate amazing. that, thank you. It's, you're, you're the one that's living the amazing, sir. You're living these words that are on this paper. How's it going? Where are you at? What's going on? Oh man, I'm just, you know, I'm living in Atlanta uh, by way of New York and been down here since 1994 and I'm loving it. and. It was, a, it was a bit of a culture shock when I first moved down here in 94. So okay. it took me a couple of years to get acclimated and, and adjusted, but I'm here and I'm loving it. And it was a culture shock because you're from New York. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Brooklyn and Queens, born and raised. Brooklyn and Queens, born and raised. Listen, everybody knows that, well, excuse me, everybody perceives New York to be a very hard place, right? A very hard place to live. That's what they think. I'm talking from an outside perspective. I used to live there, but I didn't grow up there. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, because we're talking about in spite of, and your platform and your journey and your story and just you in general, your whole testimony is that whole bio that I read was achieved in spite of. And I just, and I just really love that. And I want to talk about your cerebral palsy, but I want to know for people out there who may not know what it is. What is cerebral palsy? Great question. Cerebral palsy is more so, uh, and people have it in different ranges. Uh, I'm, I'm very blessed that I have a mild form of it where I can still do a lot of things, opposed to someone who has a severely case of cerebral palsy where they're literally like confined to a wheelchair. They've got rig rigid hand movements. Uh, sometimes they can't even feed themselves or talk because of their motor skills. But I'm um, very blessed that I can, you know, I can still live a very productive life. I drive, I jump out of airplanes, I do a little bit of everything. So. Listen, listen, <laughs> I'm all over here, all unaccomplished and stuff, you know. <laughs> no, man, you're doing fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. So when, um, in, in, your, in your life, when you were growing up, when were you diagnosed or when did you know that there was something different about you? Well, you know, for me, I didn't realize personally until probably I was around maybe late to early middle school, but my parents knew right away because uh, I remember my, my parents telling me that when I was a baby, I couldn't sit up. Oh. They would sit me in a chair and I would actually roll over. Oh. And uh, also I had a hard time keeping milk down. So to this day, I can't drink milk fresh. Like, you know, people say, Man, I just can't wait to get home and get a cold glass of milk. Oh, yeah. I can't stand it. It's got to have some type of flavor in it, chocolate or strawberry. Now, wait. You know, I just drink, eat it with cereal. Now, it, now hold on, Terry. It, now, is this because of cerebral palsy or you just don't do milk like that? I think it's really because I think, you know, my mind mentally because I couldn't drink it as a baby. It's, right. it's, it's, you just it's never liked it. <laughs> 
<laughs> I love it. Oh my goodness. So as you, cause as, so as you got older, you found out or you realized somebody told you, now did your peers tell you, did they treat you differently? Like how was the introduction to say, Hey, this kid's not like the other kids. Well, you know, when, when I was growing up in New York school and we're talking about maybe the late sixties, early seventies, I was actually, when I went to school, thrown into special ed oh. for several years. And um, I was probably picked on when I was in special ed, but didn't really understand it and know it. But then toward uh, middle school, really the beginning of middle school is when I was put in mainstream with other kids and they didn't treat me any different. Uh, I had a lot of friends. I was pretty popular in school and I had a lot of friends. I did have a bodyguard, a bodyguard in uh, middle school because I did have a bully. So I did get yeah. a bodyguard who took care of that for me. Listen, but uh, yeah. for the most part, uh, majority of my friends, they, they treated me well. So how did you, why music? Where did, where did that even, where did it even come from? I'm sorry, repeat that. I'm sorry, where did who come from? Music. Why music? You know, I, I think, you know, it's, it's for me, you're talking about for the music business. Um, well, just even being interested, you're young, you know, you have, you know, your education's going on. Um, but how did you gravitate to say, you know, what, I'm really interested in music? Watching Prince. Oh. I was, uh, I had uh, just lost my really my first corporate job. I was working in Manhattan after two years, okay. got fired okay. and I was sitting home. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was sitting in my, my bedroom. I was living with my mom at the time and uh, I was sitting on the edge of the bed sort of like I had no idea what I was going to do. I just got fired from my corporate job a couple of days earlier and Prince came on and he did um, the American Music Awards. For okay. And I remember sitting there watching him in awe of wow you know he looked like he's having a lot of fun plus he's getting paid to do it mm -hmm. that's what i want to do i want to do something where i can have a lot of fun and get paid to do it i want right? to be in the music industry and that was the first indication of really going out there and and and, and taking it seriously and, and you've had a lot of success um in the music industry working with a lot of people doing you know pr just so you guys know out there and um you know in tv land you know, I met Terry working with another artist and he was doing a lot of PR and networking. So that's how I know. That's how I know Terry. Right. So when you started um, jumping into the, the music industry, what, how did you do that? Because I know people are going to want to know your journey. You know, it's like, okay, so I want to do music. How do I get started? How did you say, here I go? Well, you know, it's funny because when I got into the music industry, my, my main thing was, I was going to work at a recording studio. Okay. Ma mainly just to push the buttons with the lights on it. That's all I could think about was, man, that looked like so much fun to be pushing the buttons with the lights on it. Yeah. And uh, about a year, two years later, I got hired at an independent record label called First Priority Music. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Nat Robinson, the owner of First Priority Music. And basically, they hired me to be radio promotion. My job was supposed to get the artist re record on the radio station. And uh, two weeks in, Nat stuck his head in the door and said, you are now a publicist. Nope. I had no idea what that was. And I said, oh, I don't know anything about publicity. He said, well, you're going to learn like that. And I learned on the spot. And that's, you know, trial and error. That's how I became a publicist. I had no idea what a publicist was. Well, you know now, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so with you working with all these people um, and you going into, I guess, getting from one lane to the next and being exposed to so many, you know, different types of elements of the industry. Does your cerebral palsy, did it ever come into play and um, stop you from any opportunities? No, you know, it's kind of interesting because in the music industry, and I'm talking mid to late 80s, yeah. where me and a gentleman by the name Dave Funkenklein were the only two people in the whole entire industry that was disabled as far as the, the hip hop side. Got it. Um, there was also another guy that I just thought about, Dave Concepcion, who was responsible for putting together a song called We're All in the Same Game. 
Mm -hmm. um, he was also part of the uh, the industry, so it wasn't a lot of us. And Dave and Dave Concepcion and Dave Funkenklein was actually in West Coast, and I was really the only one on the East Coast side. Mm. So, um, but from everybody down to Latifa to Light to Will Smith, you know, never treated me different. Wow. Yeah. I know that when you started to now, the music industry has changed quite a bit, you know, quite a bit. I know you mentioned, you know, going to a label, me as um, a musician, I definitely understand that track of, you know, you got to get signed, you got to do this, you know, spinning and or streaming and all this, this you needed your CD, a demo tape, you know, actual tape, this is before CDs, you know? <laughs> so, so, mm -hmm. so you teach people how to be successful in the, in the business. How has either your method or your knowledge changed to come into the level of success and the avenues people need to, to, to actually align themselves with to be successful now? Well, you know, the, the, the thing about it back in the, and I'm talking about the time that I got into the industry, the late eighties or so, um, the, the industry at that point had made majority of artists very lazy. Okay. And basically, it was like the labels were like, we're going to do this for you. We're going to take care of this for you. We're going to take care of that for you. All you got to do is go on stage and perform, go to a few promo stops and sign some autographs, but we're going to worry about everything else. Yeah. And a lot of artists, uh, unfortunately, today, the majority of them almost have the same mindset. Um, they're operating, even though they're independent artists, a lot of times they're operating as if they're still signed to a label, even if they're not. They're not thinking about marketing or the business side or the legal side or the mm. branding side. They're, you know, I remember having an artist tell me one time, uh, you know, I was trying to sit down and teach her about the music industry. And she's like, I really don't want to learn about the business. I just want to make music. And that that was very common. Yeah, very and common, you, very common, but it's a business. Right. Do you think that some, a lot of the the artists today, do you think they have a better handle on being well-rounded or do you think that it's still kind of the same? They seem, because it's social, they seem to know what's going on, but there's still a business component that may be missing. Oh yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely um, more so, if they have an idea, they have awareness, they just don't implement it well. They're not really doing well as far as marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, like for example, they 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 still signing contracts. You know, I, I heard about a major independent artist that signed a crazy deal a couple of months ago. Right. Um, and I still have people in my inbox. Uh, hey, take a listen to my music. No, hey, how you doing? They don't build any rapport. Gotcha. Uh, even 2022, they're just inboxing me like. Here's a link to my music. Take a listen to it. I'm like, okay, but who, who are you? Like, build a rapport with me first. Yeah. You know, and uh, they're, they're, they're not doing it. So they're real bad when it comes to internet marketing, and they're real bad when it comes to the legal side, the business side. Right. So now you are, you, you teach people. You teach them the tools that they need if they want to be an artist. Or tell me about what you do before I put words in your mouth. What do you do? Well, you know, basically, I, I, I'm i like a consultant, a coach, you know, I charge by the session. Okay. And basically, people will call me up and say, hey, listen, I want to book uh, two sessions with you this month. And they'll have some questions like, how do I go about doing this? Uh, what do you think about this? Should I go this route? And uh, or I'm teaching them a lot about the history of music because, you know, one of my biggest pet peeves is an artist that in the industry but doesn't know that they're standing next to Will Smith's business manager, James Lasseter. Uh, Everybody knows Will Smith. Everybody knows Queen Latifah, but you don't really know the people behind the scenes. And those are missed opportunities because you can be in an elevator or going down an escalator in front of you is a guy and you're like, that guy looks just like Latifah's business partner. Uh, you know, and being able to strike up a conversation and build that rapport but unfortunately, a lot of artists, and even just not artists, musicians, songwriters, they're so focused on, I got to get to know Will Smith. I got to get in front of T-Pain. I've got to get in front of this without really, let me seek out the person behind these, these great names. 
Yeah, because tr truthfully, if you know them, then you'll be able to get to the art. If you can get them, like the gatekeepers, <laughs> if, absolutely. You, if you can get absolutely. the gatekeeper, you're you know you're definitely in. Wow. Absolutely. So so you do your sessions, um, and then people are able to contact you that way. One of the things that is so interesting because you do legal advice as well. Tell me right. what that is. And I have a follow-up question to that. What is the legal advice that you get and why is that important? Well, you know, the thing I do is uh, because I partner with Legal Shield, I, I started asking um, artists and clients and songwriters and producers, hey, who's your attorney? Who do you use for attorney? And 99% of them would say, uh, I don't have an attorney. And I'm like, okay, well, why not? Oh, because it costs too much and stuff like that. And uh, why it's important because, you know, when you get a contract or you do a deal, I'll give you a perfect example. This is a young lady. She talks about it often. But if you remember the song back in the day, Let the Music Play. Yeah. Shannon. Shannon has never been paid for the last 30 years on Let the Music Play when it plays on the radio. Not with it playing for 30 years. Probably 30 plus years now. Oh my. Because when she when she did the song, they said, Oh, just go into the booth and we'll work out the deal later. Mm. <laughs> she went into the booth, laid down the vocals, and uh, a couple of months later she said that they were the producers that put a show together and somebody else was singing her track. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh so yeah, so if she had an attorney, yeah, she could have said, Hey, wait a minute, hold on, before I go into the booth. Let's get the paperwork down, you know, like that. And uh, it's been a couple of years since I've talked to her, so I don't know where she's at with it, but I know back in about five or six years ago, she was still in court fighting it. Trying and, to get some and unfortunately, and I know that a lot of, I know a lot of you out there, I know a lot of people out there have heard stories of either bad contracts or similar situations. That's why I side like that, because those stories are not new. You know, right, it's like yeah. it almost triggers me. I'm like, oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> you know, because they were so prevalent. That scenario right. sounded so familiar. Oh, we'll figure it out later. Like, mm, right, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 But, and I would yeah. imagine, and let me and let me know what you think. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that legal representation or legal activity, the need for somebody to represent you, may even be more than it was back then, just because of all the digital and all of the entrepreneur aspect that a lot of the artists really weren't dealing with. Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny how the record industry works because when you sign that deal in, let's say, the 80s, I'm going to use that as a time period, Okay. it said in the contract, per se, with the record label, we retain the right of any um, CDs or albums or airplay. They didn't okay. include digital and streaming because that wasn't even... Yeah. Relevant but, then. Yeah. But then when they started seeing all the money they were losing on the digital, they went back and revised the, the contract mm -hmm. and said, hey, no, now we're going to put this in there too. So yeah. now when an artist does a 360 deal, for example, all of that is included. Mm. Yeah. Do you think, and we're going to get back to legal stuff, but in your, uh, in your professional opinion, working with um, so many people in, in the industry and with labels, is it still a, um, a thing or a necessary thing to be signed to a label? Or is it better for an artist to just be independent? You know, it's funny. I was just having this conversation with someone and they were telling me, I, I want to say it was an artist that I was speaking to. And they were telling me, like really excited that they were about to do a distribution deal with a major label. Uh -huh. Like, oh, my God, I'm about to do this distribution deal with this major label. And I said to them, what are they distributing? Like, I mean, what are, what are they going to distribute for you? It's like, it's not like they're distributing CDs for you. Everything yeah. is digital. Yeah, sure. So it's like, you know, but the artists, unfortunately, they want to have their name attached to Universal and Sony and all these major labels to say, oh, I got a distribution deal. Yeah. Now the labels, which is so crazy now, is a lot of times, not all the time, in order to get a distribution deal now with the label, you've got to prove to them that you you actually got to follow it. Yeah. 
they want you to come to the table already yeah with the plate full yeah you know back in the days in the 80s the 70s 60s that was their job we were like listen we know yeah. nobody knows you yeah but we're gonna make you known yeah now they're like nobody knows you come back when when people know you and again you know when somebody says i got a distribution deal it always comes to like okay but what are they distributing because there's no physical product anymore yeah yeah that that's perfect that is like yeah. and i think that question is like a full stop question what are they distributing i think that's they really need to ponder <laughs> <laughs> like they really need to ponder that so so somebody would get a lot of benefit number one out of taking um just talking to you and just taking the class and the course just to get more input and insight into the music business. I want to talk about Legal Shield. Legal mm -hmm. Shield, explain to me what that is. Cool. Well, basically, Legal Shield is, is it's like I tell people it's the Netflix of the legal industry. Oh. Every month you pay Netflix, let's say $10, $15, and you have access to thousands of movies, mm -hmm. different genres. And you may not watch a single Netflix movie this month, but Netflix is going to take that $15 out of your account. Yes, they will. Next month, you may decide you want to binge all weekend and you've got that access. Well, Legal Shield works the same way. We have a nationwide network of law firms in every major city, including Alaska, as well as Canada. And you pay a monthly fee to have access to the law firms on the personal side, as well as if you're an entrepreneur or a small business owner. So for example, you may never call the law firm this month. You may not, don't have to use it, but next month you get a speeding ticket. We'll call the law firm and say, hey, I was in New York, got a speeding ticket. They'll say, send us the ticket and we'll go to court for you so you don't have to go back to New York. Or let's say, for example, you've got some contracts on the business side and before you say sign that contract, you can now say, let me let my law firm take a look at it. And you send the contracts over to the law firm and they'll take a look at it for you. Mm. So yeah, this is so it's like having an access. So who is the best? Who's the best market for this? If I was thinking about this, I'm like, but I don't know if I qualify. I don't know if this is for me. I don't know if I would need legal like that. Who is this mm -hmm. for? That's a great question. Actually, it's for it's really for everybody because we all deal with legal situations. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of a legal situation that most people don't think about. Um, You've just been overcharged by your cell phone company, let's say. Mm -hmm. Or they're giving you the runaround. And you know, they, they owe you $80 and they're giving you a runaround and you've been calling them and hey, when you guys gonna give me my money back? You know, you overcharged my account and took the money up. Well, now you can call the law firm and they'll write a letter on your behalf. No. If you get a speeding ticket, that's a legal matter because now you gotta go to court and you got points that might be added to your license. So having an attorney go to court will actually help keep the points off your license. Um, go ahead, I'm sorry. I think one of the things that you just said, you know, when you were talking about uh, the very first example that you gave, somebody may not have thought that that was a legal issue. Mm -hmm. You know, so do, have you found that Legal Shield provides opportunities for people that they didn't even know were things that they could utilize it for. I wouldn't have thought about that. I would have put that under the petty category, you know? Right. It, Absolutely. I got, I got a guy that does the business with me and he tells the story of how he went to a sandwich shop and ordered a sandwich and he specifically told him, do not put cheese on the sandwich. Oh, no. Okay. Well, they put cheese on the sandwich and when he got the sandwich, he said, hey, listen, you guys put cheese on my sandwich. No, we didn't. Yes, you did. You put cheese on my sandwich. No, we didn't. He opens up the sandwich, holds up the cheese, so you guys put cheese on my sandwich. Oh, well, you touched the sandwich. We can't do any, anything about it now. He called the law firm. Oh. Now, is that, now, now, I know he has access to the law firm. On a personal note, is that petty? Or it's just, it's your, your, it's your right? It's your right, yeah, because <laughs> they were going to make him eat a sandwich that he paid for that he didn't want. Right. He was able to get his money back and a sandwich. And think about this, too. Another legal situation is you take your clothes to the cleaners. Mm -hmm. They mess up your shirt, and you say you guys mess, and they always point to the sign, not our fault. They got the disclaimer up there. Well, they get a letter from the attorney. It can it can make a difference. Sure. One of the yeah. things that I love about what you're saying is that this is for very formal situations and very known situations, and this is also support for those everyday things that you normally shouldn't have to endure. 
that you yeah. shouldn't have to accept. It's almost yeah. like a pass to say, I don't accept that. I don't right, have to exactly. deal with that. I reject exactly. that and here's my attorney. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> how, how many how many times have we threatened customer service to say you'll be here for my attorney? Not and my attorney, attorney. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, right. so for about twenty nine bucks a month, you have an attorney. Right. This yeah. is also Legal Shield is also an opportunity for somebody to take it and have a business with Legal Shield. Is that right? Oh yeah, absolutely. I've actually, funny enough, I've got probably that I know of a dozen or more people that do the business alongside with me. Uh -huh. uh, one of the gentlemen works on this, this set of Tyler Perry. He does okay. the business. A young lady used to work for a major record label back in New York. She does the business. Uh, a young lady that's out in California who works directly with Dr. Dre. She does the business. And the guy that did the song Cupid Shuffle, he oh. actually does Legal Shield. Yeah. Well, for somebody who is, um, for somebody, because I know somebody's going to ask, and I know that you probably have heard this pushback, but for somebody that was going to say, oh, that sounds like a pyramid scheme, I don't want to do that. Well, basically, I'll tell you, know, when somebody says it sounds like a gimmick, um, one of the things I say, we've been around since 1972, mm -hmm. and we can't be, really, you can't be an illegal legal company. You know, like, you know, and we've got uh, attorney generals that are on our board. In fact, the guy that actually is the CEO of Legal Shield was actually the vice president of marketing for Microsoft. He helped develop the Xbox game. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So for somebody who is wants to hear more, because I know that there's a lot of questions. I actually have questions myself. But for mm -hmm. uh, for somebody who wants to hear more about that, they can just go to your website. Uh -huh. yeah, they can reach out to me on my website. They can call me directly on my my business line, which is 470-296-8500. Uh, okay. 470-296-8584. And they can, you know, feel free to reach out to me. And I can, you know, I normally send people a short video to watch. They can determine by watching a short video if it's something for them, even you know, on the business side, some people say, oh, yeah, the business sounds good, but I'm not interested. That's that's understandable. Or they'll say, hey, I, I want more information. Last year, they sent me and about 600 people to Mexico for free. Wow. So I'm like, you know, I'm all in. <laughs> Do you find that people are apprehensive because they just don't have enough information? They assume the pieces that they just don't know? Yeah, yeah, because a lot. I was talking to a young lady today that was like, well, what kind of law firm? Well, first of all, she didn't even say law firm. She's like, well, I don't understand how what type of attorneys can you get for twenty nine dollars a month, mm -hmm. and with a lot of times people don't understand it's not just your twenty nine dollars, but uh, like in the state of Georgia, we got about ninety thousand people paying anywhere from twenty nine dollars to one hundred and sixty nine dollars per month. So the law firm in Georgia gets paid about two million dollars every month, mm -hmm. and they one of their clients is actually Coca Cola, so they're one of the largest law firms in Georgia. Wow, see. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and one thing that's also cool, too, is because you have you're in, let's say, California, but you got an issue going on in Georgia, you can contact the law firm in Georgia and say, hey, I know I live in L.A., but I've got an issue going on in Atlanta. Can you help me with that? And the law firm in Atlanta will help you with that. So you've got access to law firms in every state. Wow. Well, I know that we're going to have to wrap up in a minute, but I want to bring us back your um your accomplishments are incredible. Being an entrepreneur and giving back the way that you are with your knowledge, and of course, even like here and your time is just so profound. For you, what, <clears throat> what encouragement would you give somebody who may think that their circumstances or what they're going through is just too much to move forward. They they don't know what to do next. I know with yours and you know disability, in spite of that, you're here training, you're here teaching, you're here making connections. You know, what encouragement would you give to somebody that may see a mountain and they just don't know how to get around it? You know, there's two things that have helped me along my journey. The first thing is problems really recycle themselves. They just come back in a full circle. So if you take a moment to say, wait a minute, I dealt with something like this before. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's like, wait a minute, this sounds so familiar. Like, 
I know I've dealt with this. And if you really think about it, it just comes in a different form. But you're like, okay, I know I've dealt with this before. And how did I handle it? I was able to handle it before. You know, how do I handle it now? And then also, I always think, um, I know I'm not the only person dealing with this. Hmm. I know I am not, you know, because we kind of, we tend to think, why is this always happening to me? Yeah. Like, why am I always going through this? But the world is going through the exact same thing. Mm, that's good. Yeah. That's deep. Terry, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. You're such an encouragement. And I just love it. <laughs> thank you for having me on. It's been an honor. And I'm loving what you're doing. I'm loving your intro with the shirt and everything. I like it. <laughs> let's connect. Let's connect afterwards because I'll send some more guests your way. Ah, listen, <laughs> don't tempt me. I sure will. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so that was Terry Moyer. Listen, all of that inspiration, all of those nuggets, in spite of there is success, in spite of there are things that you can accomplish, um, look at the big picture. One of the big takeaways here is whatever you're challenged with, whatever you're going through that you think may be a negative, you are not alone. Everybody has something that they need to get through, around, or over, and you can make it. You are the best you in the world, and we will see you next time here on The Philip Show. Don't wait.